All right, we'll get started. Thanks for coming. It's uh, getting down to the end of a, of a pretty fun week. I don't know about you guys, but I was a little hungover this morning. Uh, but I'm good now. A little fluid. That's good. Uh, so my name is Alex Josh, and I'm a product manager at uh, VMware. I'm responsible for the, the Cinder uh, product at VMware. I'm part of the extended OpenStack team. Um, and Kartik is here with me as well. I'll introduce him in just a second. Kartik is one of the core developers. Um, we also have Subu here. Subu is also another developer on our team. So um, we actually have a pretty good representation from VMware this week. So the, uh, I'll just go ahead and answer this question now, because first thing everybody asks me is, why are you guys here? So I'll just start with that. <laughs> so uh, you know, VMware is very passionate about making sure that our customers are supported and are being able to do what they want to do. Right. So our customers are telling us that they want to run OpenStack on top of vSphere and ESX, and we're like, OK, that's great. We'll go make that happen. So there's a pretty big commitment at VMware to supporting OpenStack. So we're starting to upstream. Um, actually, you know, obviously, the, the Nasera folks that we acquired last year are very plugged into this community. Um, the people on my team, on the core vSphere team, we're a little newer. So be gentle. We're, we're just learning. So uh, hopefully what you'll see today is that we've made some decent progress. But there definitely is a lot of stuff that we want to do um, to, to improve. Um, so that being said, so what is going on with OpenStack at VMware? Basically, what we're saying is we're focusing right now on uh, Neutron, Nova, and Cinder. So those are the three projects that are the most uh, impactful because of what our customers are telling us they want to do. So uh, if you don't know about the work that's being done with NSX um, and Neutron, I would definitely suggest you check it out. It's very, very, very cool stuff on the software-defined networking. And luckily, um, the guys that came over from that team have been very helpful, and the rest of us teaching us how to be uh, open stackers. Uh, is that a verb? No. Um, stacker. That's a. That's better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, my my guys in the front row are trying to make me laugh. Okay. So then we have um, the the Nova support, the core compute support, um, and uh, you know it's kind of interesting because I've seen some people say, hey, why don't we just have Nova go talk to ESX? Um, that's probably not what you want to do, and that's probably not what we're going to be doing going forward. Really, um, Nova and um, Cinder are going to be talking to, to vCenter itself. And the reason why you want to do that is because it really lights up all the core features um, that make the product work. So if you go talk to um, an enterprise class customer that's running um, VMware today, they're, they're all running vSphere, and vSphere is really the interface that they're using. And that's pretty, probably the reason why they're running VMware in the first place is because of the features that are inside of vSphere. So, um, so just a show of hands, how many of you people are really familiar about VMware and vSphere and all this stuff? OK. How many of you are not super familiar with, and the rest of you are pretty hungover? OK. So um, I, I won't get too much into details then about the way vSphere, that's so basically about half the hands raised up for the people listening on the recorder. So I won't get too into the details. Um, we are working on um, things around Glance and, Sw and Swift. I'm not going to pre-announce anything, but we're definitely want to make sure that we operate well within customers that are running uh, Glance and Swift implementations. We have really uh, good partners, especially in the Swift space around object storage. Object storage is not something we do ourselves, but we want to enable that. So if that's something you're interested in, you know, definitely come by the booth or talk to us directly. I'm not going to get into that in this session. Um, so what we are going to talk about, though, is storage. Right? This is Cinder. So this is all about storage. So hopefully you guys are all really major storage geeks, I'm thinking. Yeah, absolutely. OK, you can quote T10 in your sleep. Yeah, anybody know what the T10 is? No, nobody? OK. Crickets. Crickets. All right, so we're going to be talking about T10 today. Um, so from a VMware perspective, we really believe in this notion of, of software-defined storage. And we think that the abstraction of the control plane away from the actual implementation detail is hugely important in that this next generation of infrastructure. And if you look at what's going on inside of the OpenStack community, that's pretty much what's going on here as well. So this is something we believe in. This is something we want to support. Um, we're going to do this in a bunch of different ways. Um, at VMware, we have a lot of implementations that already exist. There's a lot of infrastructure running. So we can't just introduce an entirely new concept and leave everybody else behind. That, that's not going to work, because we have millions of customers out there that would be left behind. So we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to make incremental changes we're going to do some brand new technologies that are pretty different and, frankly, could be considered disruptive. And then we're also going to be supporting people that are already in production and try to bring them forward. So whenever we have this conversation from VMware and storage, you're always going to see us kind of have mixed messages, right? There's going to be, hey, if you want to start completely from scratch, you could do this. And then we're going to say at the same time, we're going to say, oh, but by the way, if you really love your SAN and you want to keep the way SAN you have, 
great, you can do that. So you're always going to see us saying both things, and that's very intentional. Because for some customers, they really want to just do a greenfield implementation of OpenStack, and they want to start completely from scratch, which is great. But there's a lot of customers who just can't do that. You know, the guy, they've got millions or even, I don't know, billions of dollars invested in hardware and infrastructure and data centers that are already running, and you really can't just rip those out. So when we think about the um, abstraction layer, about the policy layer, um, what we really mean is that there is going to be a universal policy abstract that's true across all the different ways that you can interact with storage on a, on a vSphere platform. So there's um, traditional storage on a SAN or a NAS device, or there's direct attached storage. All of those things are always going to run in the exact same policy framework. Right? And so it'll appear as if the storage is all exactly the same. It won't be, but it'll appear that way to the end customer, which is the whole point. And hopefully this does sound familiar, because this is exactly what Cinder is trying to do as well. Right? So we're very much aligned in that vision. What's new and what's different for us is this notion to say, well, what we want to do is we want to put storage directly into the hypervisor. And we refer to this as, as vSAN. So when you hear us talk about vSAN, and we kind of get all excited about vSAN, because we do that, and we rock vSAN t-shirts, um, it's because you get to have native storage capabilities right in the hypervisor. So basically, you're, what we're talking about literally is a server, a normal vSphere server, an ESX server, sorry to be more clear, that you put just JBOD, right, regular old disks, um, a mix of SSDs and rotating media. And then the hypervisor itself manages that storage and shares it amongst the members of the cluster. So it's not really a SAN in the traditional definition. Really. It's really a software storage abstraction layer that's extremely performant because it's local to the machine. It has integrated SSD and rotating media, so you get that kind of hybrid strategy where you get high IOPS on the SSD and high capacity on the rotating media. It's very uh, stable and reliable because it's replicated amongst the members of the cluster, right? So you can lose a node or a couple of nodes, and you don't lose anything. It doesn't look like a SAN. It doesn't work like a SAN. It's not, there's, there's no knobs to turn. There's no configuration. There's no fiber channel, right? It's just plain old Ethernet and it's completely automatic. So when I say it's a little disruptive, that's what I mean. It's not super comfortable to your traditional storage guy. Right? So if you have somebody that's been installing EMCs you know, for the last 10 years and he's really comfortable with it, th they may not be really excited about vSAN, and, that, and that's fine. But if you have something that's starting from scratch and saying, look, I want to build out a, cl a, a cloud infrastructure with basically one very flat infrastructure with I want compute and network and everything in one and I don't want, I want complexity, I just want it to work, you know, for them, vSAN might work out. And that's the reason why we created it. Remember I said I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth, so here it goes. So in, at the same time, we have lots of customers who are like, look, I, I've already got a SAN. I already paid for it, right? It was really expensive. I want to keep using it. And it does all these things that I want it to do, and I don't want to stop using it. Okay, great. So we created something we call virtual volumes, or VVOL. VVOL is the ability to abstract uh, VMDKs, right, virtual disks, directly into a storage array, a SAN or a NAS. And what happens is, is that we abstract these objects directly into the SAN, and now the SAN becomes aware of these virtual disk abstractions, virtual volumes, VVOLs. And so what happens is now we can do exactly the, the same kind of granular policy-based management for virtual volumes, just like we do with VMDKs that are sitting local to the hypervisor. See what's happening here? So we have a, a SAN or NAS-based technology using the same policy framework, the same VMDK granular management, the same tools, the same Cinder driver, exactly the same, everything's the same, but the back end in one case is, say, a VMAX, and the back end on the other side is just some random disks that you crammed into your, to your hypervisor. The consumption model is identical. It's no different. It's the same cinder driver. The policy model, identical. It's exactly the same. And that's the point, right? Is this one, is virtual volumes better than vSAN? No, right? It, that's not the point. It's different. It, it, customers need that type of choice on the back end. There's reasons why people buy SANs. There's reasons why people buy direct attached storage. We're not going to try to tell people one's right or one's wrong. We need to support all those infrastructures, and we need to make the consumption model identical. 
That's the reason why we're here. Does that make sense? Yeah, question? So what happened to VMFS? So v VMFS, um, lar long term, VMFS go pretty much goes away. The, the reason why VMFS exists is to allow us to share a single lung amongst multiple uh, 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 hosts. In a, in a vSAN world, you actually do have something called VMFSL, which is a non-clustered version of VMFS, but each local house has its, every disk has its own little mini VMFSL partition. So the traditional clustered VMFS file system doesn't really exist in a vSAN world. In a vVol world, you don't have LUNs at all. So again, there's no VMFS. But what we've done is we've actually abstracted that implementation detail pretty low in the stack. So the consumption model, you're unaware of it. In fact, even if you're an API user, which is pretty low level, you're still unaware of it. So is there, is there any migration path from VMFS to VVOL? The, the question is, is there any migration path? Uh, no, but you don't need one, right? You just bring on the new data store, and then you do NSV motion, and then you're good. Um, for people that, so it sounds like you really know something about vSphere. If you want to have detailed conversation, I'm happy to have it with you. Um, I only have 40 minutes, so I'm going to keep going. Sorry. Okay. Um, and then you apply on top of that what we call SPBMs, um, uh, storage policy-based management. So the SPBM layer, that's the policy abstraction that applies to these underlying implementations. So you'll be able to say something like, I want to have a certain level of RTO, or I want a certain backup schedule. Right? And then we will make placement decisions against the back end based on the request that you've made here. So you don't say, I want a fiber channel line or I want an NFS line. You say, I want replication or I don't. Or I want low latency or I don't really care about latency. Or, right? So now you say what you want, what you're trying to achieve, not necessarily how to get it done. And then you let us worry, the, the platform could worry about how to make that happen. So this abstraction basically makes your infrastructure less brittle, right? So in a traditional environment, you would write a script, right, in PowerShell or something that said, you know, create a VMDK on this, on this data store or in this cluster, right? And then your storage administrator will come along and re-architect the storage and now your script breaks. That doesn't really scale to thousands of objects or millions of objects. On the other hand, using storage policy-based management, you would say, I want an object of this class. Well, that script works all the time, will always work, right? You never have to change the script because you're always asking for the same thing. Well, you apply the exact same thing to Cinder. So Cinder comes and asks us today for something relatively simple, like I want a thin disk or eager zero disk or something like that. In the future, they'll come and say, I want a disk with these properties. And that Cinder volume type will just always work, regardless of the underlying implementation changes. <coughs> yeah, with me so far? OK. And I apologize, I'm going super, super fast because we only have 40 minutes. Um, so I think this is obvious to most of the people in the room, but just to be certain, we have had a, a storage abstraction layer for some time in vSphere, right? So some people in the industry are talking about storage virtualization like that was a new thing. I, apologies for those of you that have blogged that in this room. I would argue that's not actually not that new, right? If you think about what a LUN is, uh, LUN is fundamentally a, a storage abstraction. You virtualized some physical media into a logical object, which you think is a disk, and it has sectors and all these fun things, but it's not actually, right? It's just a logical construct. So isn't that virtualization? It sort of is. Um, and within vSphere, we have this notion of a data store, which is an abstraction on top of that LUN. So we say above that abstraction, we apply another abstraction. And we've had that for some time. So this notion of having a highly abstracted storage universe is not new to us. So today, if you're consuming like NFS or, or iSCSI or Fiber Channel, the, the vSphere administrator is not really aware of that. So we're just extending that same metaphor. And it's really the VMDK that allows us that portability. So I know some people in the community have been working with RDMs. And, um, and, I, and there's actually some really good work that's going on around RDMs. Th the only thing that I would ask is that you really think carefully about deploying RDMs in your environments or your customers' environments. And the reason beca is because RDMs were designed to be kind of the storage of last resort, right? You really should be using RDMs only when the workload you're using absolutely positively requires an RDM and cannot run on a VMDK. So for example, uh, Windows uh, guest clustering uh, quorum disks, right? Because they use SCSI reservations, you can't run them on a VMDK. Everything else should be running on VMDKs. 
And the reason for that is because everything that I'm going to talk about in the future is assuming you're running in a VMDK and not on an RDM. So you're really limiting yourself. And there's some, there's some things that are broken in VMDKs that cause you to want an RDM. And when I say RDM, by the way, I mean a, a raw device map, right? So this is a pass-through disk. Sorry for those of you who are not VMware people. Um, we're fixing that is the answer, right? So we're going to make VMDKs generic so they can support all kinds of workloads. And basically what that means is that RDM, hopefully, you won't need them anymore. So I'm not announcing that we're like deprecating RDM, but what I'm asking you is to please try to stay away from them and don't encourage your customers to use them because we don't want them to be pissed off at us next year at this time when we say, hey, by the way, <laughs> we're all done with that. So our driver, our Cinder driver is focused on VMDK and, and that's the reason for that. Any questions about that? Any passionate defense of RDM in this room? One over here? Okay. You want to ask a question or make a statement? Right. Right. So the feedback we got is that the, the healthcare guys use this for like sounds like a compliance check or a HIPAA kind of things, and in the end for snapshotting. So the answer would be um, Vivol was created to address that concern. So in a Vivol world, you will have that tattoo that goes all the way down and all the way back again. But we definitely. That's why I'm saying I can't tell you today. Hey, RDM's dead. But uh, I would love to tell you that, but I can't. What we're saying is we're making progress over time. So yeah, in a use case like yours, you need them, you need them. But we're just trying to get rid of them. And we're basically taking each one of those use cases away one at a time. So hopefully over time we'll get to the point where we don't need them anymore. All right. Okay. Oops. Let's see, I think I can. All right, so, in, um, so how does this work? What's the workflow? So um, as with Nova, uh, we set up a capacity pool that's then consumed by the driver. So what happens today in the, in the Havana release is that we're actually just selecting from the available data stores on, on, the, uh, on the cluster. Going forward, we're going to add some selection criteria and SPBM and other things. But today, we just pick amongst the, the available data stores. Then the cloud administrator creates um, the cinder volume types. And then you consume against that capacity. Right? Um, the, when you create a Cinder volume, we actually go into the back end and we create the metadata for it. We don't actually create the VMDK. Then only at the attach time do we actually create a VMDK. And I'm going through this really quick because Kartik is going to show you a demo of this in just a second. But I just wanted to give you an overview and have it written down so you can see what the steps were. So the important thing really out of all this thing, the only thing really to remember is it's a lazy create. We create the VMDK at attach time. And the reason why we do that is because that way we're guaranteed to create it on a data store that the VM can actually see, right? So if you have a data store attached to cluster one and your, and your VM is on cluster two, the first thing you have to do is do a storage vMotion, right? So that doesn't make any sense. So we wait until we know where our attach point is and then we create it then. Right? And we're gonna show you a demo of this in just a second. Um, we are using the, the extra specs mechanism and we are passing metadata down into the driver. And again, Kartik's going to show you this in a second. Um, right now, um, we're, we're doing things like um, thin, thick, or ego, and eager zeros thick. Um, the, and we're also controlling what kind of clone you can do. In the future, we're going to have a lot more uh, richness. And in fact, for the Ice House release, we're talking about a lot of enhancements to the type of uh, metadata you can pass down into the driver. OK? Um, I think I, actually, I think I'm just going to. Okay, one second on Shadow VM. So I mentioned, I didn't mention this, did I? So the other interesting thing that's happening is, is we need a mechanism. Remember I said that we create metadata before we actually create the VMDK? When I said create metadata, what I really meant was we create a fake VM. Inside of vSphere, there's no notion of a disk as a parentless object. Disks are children of VMs. So if you want to create a VMDK, you have to have a VM to attach it to. But in Cinder, it doesn't work that way. In Cinder, an a disk is a disk. So what we do is we create a fake VM. We call it a shadow VM. We attach the VMDK to that, and then it becomes its parent, and it follows it around. And again, we're going to show you this in a second. So it is a little bit of a kludge, and I apologize. But just from a platform perspective today, and this is something we're working on fixing, but today, you can't actually create a disk unless it's part of a VM parent object. Right? So thus, 
this fake VM that you'll see. And if you run uh, Vova or something like that in your lab and you open up the UI, you'll see these fake VMs, right? We call them shadow VMs. Okay, good. Kartik, you're on, babe. Cinderman is on. Hi guys, so uh, let's just start with the demo. And uh, first we'll walk through the, the initial setup that we have in the, uh, in the system. So we have the Nova that uses the VC driver and talks to the virtual center server. We have two Debian virtual machines that have been created. And if you go to the VC UI, you can see the, there is a single cluster with uh, two ESX machines. And you have a visible data store for each of the ESX machines. These are not sh shared across the ESX machines. And these are the two virtual machines that have been created by ANOVA. If you look at the hardware section, you can see each of them have a single ephemeral disk, and they are present on either of the hosts. Now, we also have Cinder that is configured to talk to this particular virtual uh, center server. It uses the VC plugin. And if you look at the current list of volumes, there are nothing. So we go ahead by creating them. So as the first step, what we do is we create a volume type. Uh, so the Cinder driver, the VMDK driver, allows user to specify a VMDK type. And that can be done via the extra specs in the volume type. And uh, if you look at this particular example, we create an uh, extra spec type to do a thick provisioning. And uh, that is the extra spec entry we uh, add in this thick volume. And uh, as uh, uh, Alex mentioned, we, provide, uh, we, we support three types of VMDK types today, thick, thin, and uh, eager zero thick. Now, this particular step is not a necessary thing, and you can always choose not to specify extra spec, in which case we, by default, create a thin provision VMDK volume. And uh, if you see, we, we first try to create a volume uh, with this thick uh, type and of 1 GB size. Now, one of the things that, again, as mentioned, uh, once we do this creation, you will, not be, you will not be seeing any backing for this volume in the inventory, in the VC inventory, because uh, this at this point, the volume is not used at all. It's, it's more of a stateless volume. It's a fresh volume. And we actually create it only when it's being used for the first time. That is, now we go ahead and we try to attach it to, a, uh, to Debian VM1. This is when the uh, driver figures out that, OK, it's being uh, used for the first time. So let me just go ahead and create a backing. And now it. Uh, it sees that, OK, the Debian VM is present on my ESX host one. So let me just go create there, pick a data store, and it will create there. So now if you see the first step it does is it will be creating a volume, a shadow VM. So the Cinder volumes is the kind of uh, VC folder it uses, where it aggregates all your volumes there. And uh, as a second step, it uh, attaches the VMDK of the volume to the instance. If you just go to the hardware section, you can see a second disk for this particular instance. And uh, the the volume the third VM you see on your inventory is the shadow VM for it. And if you go and look at the hardware section of it, the hardware details, hard disk details, you can see that it's a thin provision one, and that's the data store path of the VMDK file. Now this is sort of the VC side of things, and uh, whereas if for 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 the the OpenStack end user who uh, who's logging into the uh, uh, the OS guest directly. For him, it's more of he should be uh, kind of discovering a new device that's been attached and uh, to check whether if it has a valid partition table and a file system, and then just go ahead, mount, and start using it. So now uh, he can probably do some sort of a continuous uh, log file backup from his production system or database file backup on his production system. And since it's a persistent store, he should be able to detach this from the instance, attach it onto another instance, and probably he has some sort of a, a mm, validation software that's running, some troubleshooting, or some sort of a log analyzer software running there. And uh, the, the, the state that's been written in this particular uh, instance the f of the first attach should be there at the later point of attach also. So in this particular case, we show in the Debian system where uh, 
since since we have attached a fresh disk, uh, the the device will not actually have a partition a table or a file system. So here we do everything. We we partition that particular device. We create a file system on it. We mount it and we save some state. In this case, we just add a text file to it. So uh, yeah, so here we just do the mount and uh, save some state. And once I detach this and I present it to another instance, I should be able to see the same old state in that. Now, uh, one of the thing that the driver, uh, one of the thing the user of the open uh, the OpenStack user need not worry about is the kind of uh, uh, Infrastructure topology he has on VC, that is, you can have any number of clusters, your Nova is configured to any number of ESX machines or data store. And, and the Cinder driver takes care of presenting the volume to an instance where it has to be attached. It does all sorts of movement here and there. And uh, yeah, the, the end user re really need not worry about any of those things. So here we see that we have written a text file. Now uh, we just go back and uh, we detach this particular volume from the Debian VM1. And uh, what we should be seeing is uh, the shadow VM is still left because it's a persistent store. And the Debian VM should now just have a single hard disk earlier when it had to, uh, it was attached. And so you have the detached process going on. And once it's done, let's just go to the VC inventory and check. Yeah, now the detach has been successful. And if you just go look at the hardware section of Debian VM1, you Now you see that uh, it just has a single hard disk, so the volume has been detached from it, and you have the shadow VM left in the inventory. Now this is present on ESX host one, where the Debian VM one was uh, being managed by. And now I try to attach, uh, we try to attach the same volume to another, e uh, another the Debian VM two, which is present on the second or the first ESX, a different ESX. So as I mentioned earlier, the Cinder driver takes care of doing all the jugglery. So here in this case. It figures out that this data store where the shadow VM is present is not visible to the ESX. So it'll try to migrate or move these files over to the other ESX where the, the, the VM to which it should attach is present. So that step is happening here. And second step which it does is it reconfigures the VM by adding the volumes VMDK. So if you just look at the hardware section of it, uh, the first instance, uh, now you see a second hard disk present. Right. Now this is uh, that of the volume. Now, uh, from our earlier attach, we had done all the steps of creating a partition table, formatting it, and we have written a file on it. So once the second user of this OS, uh, he should just be able to discover that particular device, and he should be able to recover that state so that he can continue working on it from this point onwards. So here you can see that uh, we have just scanned for new device, and we found a partition device. Now we just sort of mount this. And, and once we are done, we should have the text file present here, which we had written earlier. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, this, this is a quick demo where we show just the attach and detach. So before I go, this, these are the, this, this is the list of comprehensive uh, APIs, the Cinder APIs that the driver supports as of today. So you have the create volume, uh, you have the three supported VMDK types as of today. So you can do a create from scratch, you can, you can uh, create it from a glance image, you can clone from an existing source volume, you have two types of clone supported, one is a full clone or a link clone. And then you also can do, you can do a full clone or a link clone from a snapshot point. Uh, and then you have uh, the attach and detach to an instance. You can snapshot an available volume. And so Kartik, what about um, optional APIs? Uh, what, what's our plan there with optional APIs, the ones we don't support today? Yeah, so uh, the plan is we'll be getting it, uh, at least the, the important ones to, we, we currently we're talking to the customers and we're just picking the, the APIs that they want and I hopefully we'll try to get it by the next release. Yeah, so we've had some very good conversations this week with a bunch of customers. So if there's things in the Cinder spec that you're very passionate about or you have specific use cases where we should e emphasize one or the other, 
definitely it's a good chance to let us know. Our intent, though, just to be clear, is to support the entire Cinder spec, right? All the optional components as well. But this is what we're, where we're at right now. Okay. Any questions for for Kartik? And remembering that he's the technical smart guy, and I'm the PM guy. So keep your questions appropriately aligned, right? A a any questions for Kartik while we have him? Awesome. Cool. Thank you, sir. Okay. So getting on to so that's what we have now. Um, this is upstreamed into Havana. So go ahead and grab it. Um, there's a couple of patches that have been made. There was a couple of bugs that we found. So please do check it out. If you have bugs, report them in the community. There's a dedicated um, OpenStack community um, in the VMware communities, that which you can talk to us directly. But obviously, we participate. And if you file a bug um, with the OpenStack, we'll, we'll see that, obviously. So we'll, we'll pr we participate in the OpenStack community, but we also have ours. So it just depends on where you want to. If you're a VMware customer, just go ahead and use the OpenStack community inside of VMware.com. Um, so right now, uh, we have a committed uh, roadmap to support storage policy-based management, which is a slide I talked about earlier, right? So this notion of attaching policy to a disk is uh, committed for Ice, Ice House. Um, we're gonna, we have some issues around with snapshot and cloning of, of attached volumes. So today, what happens is that when we take a snapshot, it's always an application-consistent snapshot of the VM, right? Keeping in mind that for us, a disk is a child object of a VM. So we can't actually snapshot a disk. We always snapshot the VM. But in Cinder, Cinder has this notion of a, of a disk snapshot. So what happens today is if you take a disk snapshot with an unattached Cinder volume, everything's fine, right? We snapshot the shadow VM, and everything's fine. But if you try to snapshot at a mounted volume, we'll fail the operation, which actually is OK, because that's what Cinder expects us to do. But there's a lovely force com uh, command, right, which, which is supposed to override that behavior. We'll fail that, too. Sorry about that. Um, we're working on architecture to fix that. But as of today, you basically cannot do a Cinder snapshot of a mounted volume. You, you just can't. We'll fail it, even if you pass as the force option. Um, we're also working with the Oslo guys. There's a lot of common code between the vSphere driver for Cinder and the vSphere uh, driver for Nova, which doesn't really make any sense. So we're gonna, working on a project right now um, to move that into Oslo. And actually, Subu over here is uh, working on that. So if you have thoughts about that, the gentleman here. Um, the, uh, we have some API uh, work to do. Um, and, and obviously, anything new that comes along in Icehouse, we're going to do. Um, and then finally, this is not really a Cinder thing, but we're also going to add SPBM support to Nova. right? So if you think about a Nova boot volume, there's no reason why Nova can't request um, services from the underlying storage stack just like Cinder can. Right? So we're going to make basically the Cinder and the Nova implementation uh, identical. So you'll be able to get all the goodness in Cinder that you get uh, in Nova that you're going to get in Cinder. It'll be the same. Um, so now we get into the speculative part of the conversation, and we have a really extensive five minutes to have this conversation. So hopefully we'll get into a lot of detail. No, we won't, actually. But just to get you thinking, and maybe we'll talk outside about this, we're working on what we're going to work on beyond um, the committed release. Um, so one thing we're thinking about that we're interested in is a common metadata model between the two. For us, the backing storage for Cinda and Nova are usually the same in a vSphere environment, right? We don't really have... Um, v, you, know, you know, bootable data stores and data data stores. Right? We don't really have that notion. So there really is no reason why the metadata models are, are different in our world. So it would be helpful if they had a common model. Um, we're also thinking about application consistent snapshots. Now for us, we always take an application consistent snapshot all the time. There really isn't a notion for that in Cinder, right? So we may try to introduce that notion um, into Cinder. Obviously, this is a, not a driver thing. This is actually Cinder itself would have to change a little bit to and allow this. And really what we mean by this is that if you take a snapshot of a mounted volume, what we, we probably would prefer is that we actually hand that snapshot request to Nova right, and tell Nova to snapshot the entire app, right, not just the data volume. So just an idea. Um, right now, there's no DR or HR considerations, on, well, not, none real to speak of in Cinder. Um, for us, in an underlying platform, there's, there's a lot of ways that we can replicate or mirror or back up uh, volumes to foreign locations. Um, there really, the, there's a notion of an availability zone in Cinder, but uh, honestly, it's kind of broken, right? There, it's not really fully implemented. So one option would be to fully implement um, the notion of availability zones in Cinder. And then from, from our driver, we hook that up to our platform. And then other, obviously, we'd, we'd expect the other guys to hook that up in their drivers as well. Um, there's no notion of storage QoS right now in Cinder. It, it would be interesting if Cinder could ask for a specific service level. 
um, our platform and others can provide differentiated service levels. You know, this is not an unusual thing in the storage business, um, but Cinder doesn't really know how to ask for that. Um, uh, today, there isn't really there's um, there's a uh, migrate command in Cinder, right? Is that what they said? Yeah, there's a migrate uh, API in Cinder. We don't implement it in our current product, but we're thinking about implementing it. There's some data mobility services in the platform that we could hook up um, to that migrate command. So we're working on that. Um, right now, we don't really do any alerting. So if you ask for a certain SLA for an object and you, that viol SLA is violated, there's really no way to tell Cinder that that happened, right? So maybe that's a Solometer thing, I don't know. But one, we would like to hook it up so that basically when your SLA is violated, you get some sort of a no notification in Horizon, right? A, a little I red icon at least, right? That says, hey, by the way, you know that disk you asked me for? It's, it's actually compromised. And this is kind of a problem. So today there's really no mechanism to do that. Um, and we talked about availability zone. So that's kind of what our thoughts are. Um, any feedback from the room, based on what you've seen so far, any feedback about things you really think that we should be working on? Any, any suggestions, any areas we haven't talked about? Definitely open to your input. This is a community thing, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a community thing. No input? Everybody's sleepy? There's one guy in the back that's falling asleep. <laughs> OK. So uh, if you're too shy to bring it up in a big room, I understand. So we, uh, we're happy to take these offline. And if you have, we'll, you know, we're on the IRC chats now and things like that. Um, uh, both Kartik and Subu are attending the, uh, the, um, uh, the developer sessions, which they had to step out of it to come to here. So thanks, guys, for that. OK. Um, there are a bunch of other um, VMware-led sessions this week. Um, I'm, I'm going to read every one of them now. So just, no, I'm not. The, most of these have already happened, so my apologies for that. But obviously, they've all been recorded. So I would definitely encourage you to take a look and um, check them out. No, the, the really interesting thing about this particular um, slide is that I've had people tell me this week that VMware is not committed to OpenStack, which, which I found was a very interesting comment. Being an OpenStack guy at VMware, I, you know, I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, we're pretty committed, right? There's a lot of sessions we're delivering. There's a big team inside of VMware that doesn't do anything but OpenStack stuff, right? So to me, we're committed, right? We're, we're voting with our time and our effort. We're here. There's like 35 of us here. Um, that's probably not the biggest contingent of any company, but we're pretty committed. And uh, you know, we're doing a lot. The, the, the storage team at, at, at uh, VMware, we're pretty new to this. So you probably haven't seen us active in the community because we're so new. But our intent is to definitely be active and to make contributions and to um, support others and do code reviews and all those good things that you expect from a proper community member. So what I would say is that um, our intent is to be much more visible. Um, the last six months or so, we've been um, very low key because we didn't want to just come stomping in with our big old boots and say, hey, we're VMware, you know, get over it. it. That didn't really work. So we've intentionally been listening a lot more than talking, right? Because we wanted to make sure that we understood what people were saying and what was going on and what the issues were and stuff like that. So now we feel like we kind of got an idea. So we've got some code um, in the Havana release, which is a big, nice milestone for us. So you're going to see us becoming much more active, especially in the Ice House releasing going forward. So um, we're really excited to be a member of the community. We're excited to be here. Um, this has been a really good week for us. We've gotten a lot of great input from the, from the community. So um, with that, that's the conclusion of the talk. And we can, uh, the demo that we just did is up on uh, YouTube. Um, you can go to the community site, the, the VMware OpenStack community site, and get links to it. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at ajosh on Twitter. And I'm always happy to answer your questions. So thank you all very, very much. Hopefully this was informative. Thank you. Thank you.